seventh victory loan open. The home front and the battle front team up to supply the money to help win the victory. In the field, every formation has its victory loan organizer, and the men line up to sign up. They have an eye on the future. They know it takes money besides men to win the war. Even in the hospital, they are lending their money. Captain William Grayson, M.C., who went to France on D-Day, buys a bond. Sergeant Stollery, M.M., of the Canadian Army Film Unit, buys a bond. The veterans of today know that victory bonds are insurance for the future. His Eminence, Cardinal Villeneuve, arrives at an airport in the United Kingdom. He is welcomed by Major General Montague, Air Chief Marshal Sir Frederick Bowhill, and a group of dignitaries of the church and senior chaplains of the forces. At London's Westminster Cathedral, a church parade is held for Canadian Roman Catholic personnel. The service is presided over by the Cardinal, the Archbishop of Quebec. Cardinal Villeneuve has stopped off in England on his way to the Holy See in Rome. During his stay, he will visit many hospitals housing Canadians back from the front line. In Camp Borden, Ontario, a group of members of the United Automobile Workers Union from Windsor and Ottawa pay a visit to the men of the Canadian Army. Trading factory overalls for the black coveralls and berries of the Canadian Armored Corps, the workers see at first hand the use made of the machines they themselves have built. The workers talk to army men, get taken for a ride over some of the toughest tank proving grounds of the empire, and generally absorb the army slant on life of the fair. They see demonstrations of the excellent gunnery that is contributing to the winning of the war in France and Italy. The visit gives war workers a chance to live the army life for a few days, and that includes sampling army chow. Arranged by the Department of National Defense and the Wartime Information Board, the bugle call replaces the factory whistle for three days packed full of interesting experiences. A complete tour of the great training camp gives the workers added incentive to put that last ounce of energy into the production line. The energy which will keep the wheels of victory rolling at top speed. The visit has been a splendid thing. Civilian workers and army men have had a real get-together. General Worthington, camp commandant of Borden, says, come and see us again sometime. At Monte area, Lake Matisi, one of the highest lakes in Italy, is the scene of an unusual religious ceremony. Canadian servicemen of the various Protestant denominations and the Church of England take part in mass baptisms. Padres of the United Church of Canada and the Church of England preach and baptize according to the laws of their churches. Anglicans congregate in a site appropriately called Westminster Abbey. Colonel J. Logan Bengta addresses the Presbyterians in what they call St. Giles Cathedral. Other groups include the Lutherans, Mennonites, Pentecostal, and Dutch Reformed. The followers of John the Baptist conduct the ceremony of baptism by total immersion in Lake Matisi. Never before in Italy has a service like this been held. It was organized by Major E.J. Bailey with the cooperation of other Padres. 470 Canadian soldiers were baptized. A battery of the famous 15-inch guns of British Coast Artillery at Dover come under the command of the 1st Canadian Army during the attack on Boulogne. The great shells, each weighing a ton, 
proved forceful arguments against the continued good health of the Nazis in the Channel ports. The operation calls for extremely accurate firing. Reversing the usual method of artillery support, the guns fired toward the Canadian troops. They must not shoot plus at any time or the shells will fall on our troops attacking the town. Veteran coast defense artillerymen have had years of training in Hellfire's corner to prepare themselves for the job. controlled by radio from Canadian oak pits in France. The great shells from Dover land with pinpoint accuracy on enemy strong points outside the town. The way is thus well prepared for the Canadian armor and, and infantry to mount the final all-out assault. Royal Canadian Air Force bomber group opens the last assault on Boulogne. Wave after wave of bombers attack points marked on the map by the Canadian Army. caused by our bombing and artillery fire. One after another, the Nazi strong points are cleaned out. They only give in after putting up a terrific struggle. Orders from the Fuhrer say, fight to the last man. It's a case of taking the town by storm the hard way. The tide of battle is finally turned in our favor by a concentrated attack of Canadian armor. What is left of the town is demolished by its defenders before they surrender. line of prisoners give themselves up to forward troops. Since D-Day, Canadians alone have captured 52,000 all ranks. Johnny Canuck is a popular figure with the natives. So are his fags. Resplendent in his Nazi zoot suit, Lieutenant General Ferdinand Heim gives himself up to Brigadier Rockingham of Victoria, B.C. Boulogne is ours. the 1st Canadian Army during the past few weeks has been to clean the Jerry's out of the Channel ports. It's a slow and bitter drive, but one by one the ports are captured. Many solid fortifications which have taken the enemy years to build fall into our hands. It might have been a pleasant country estate of some rich Frenchman, but behind the gay exterior, a strong port is disclosed. Gunners of a Canadian Field Regiment, RCA, salvage a German 155mm coastal gun. French guns were brought from the Maginot Line by the Germans. They are now turned against Jerry. Using his own gun sight to blast enemy positions in Dunkirk is a good joke to the boys of the RCA. The Newport Beach area has been one of the greatest menaces to the Channel shipping. Now it's a menace to the garrisons who still hopelessly hold out against the Canadian Army. Some of the gun sites were blown up by the enemy before they evacuated them. Well camouflaged, they are guarded by concrete emplacements many feet thick. A 
secret blockhouse said to have contained amazing electrical apparatus which would stop a plane in flight is overrun. Situated near Potton, north of San Omer, the blockhouse was severely bombed by our Air Force. Engineers say it was built to house a tremendous generator. They are mystified by the whole thing. Steel doors, eight inches thick, guard the approach. Although most of the equipment has been taken away, sufficient proof remains that a considerable menace to Britain has been removed by the Canadian Army's advance up the Channel coast. <laughs>